Amen. And we want to thank you again for joining us here at Victory Outreach Third Wave LA. Amen. I want to thank our beautiful worship team. Don't you love our beautiful worship team? I think they're the very best. Amen. And we want to welcome you to our house today. And we want you to know that this is a place that you could call home and a people that you could call family. When you walked into the doors of Victory Outreach Third Wave LA, you became a family member of ours. And we hope that you feel that love here this morning. We hope that as, as the day goes on and the weeks go on, that you would join us again because you're part of this great family. Amen. I want you to open your Bibles with me here this morning to Ecclesiastes 3. And we're going to start in verse 1. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. I believe the Lord has a word for you here today. got it we're going to start reading there in verse one it says this there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to uproot a time to kill and a time to heal a time to tear down and a time to build a time to weep and a time to laugh a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate time for war and a time for peace this morning I want to talk to you about squeezing our season squeezing our season let's pray father we come before you this morning Lord I pray Lord that you would show us Lord father how to go through the seasons of life and get everything that you have for us Lord father so many of us walked in Lord in different seasons of our life Lord but I know this morning, Lord, your word's going to go loud and clear. It could go where man cannot go, Lord. Father, it could go into the heart of man, Lord. It could divide, Lord, bone and marrow, soul and spirit, Lord. I pray your word go deep today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give your neighbor a high five, and you can take your seat here today. Let your neighbor say, squeeze your season. I want to ask you, what show have you been watching lately? Many of us, and, and you know, you don't got to lie to kick it. You, we binge watch shows, right? Have you ever binge watched something on Netflix, anybody? You're making me seem like I'm the only one in the room. Have you ever binge watched something on Netflix? Have you ever, have you ever binge watched something on Netflix more than you're proud of? Like you finished something in one night. You've seen the whole, there's like 16 episodes and you watched every single one of them. Recently, Squid Games came out, right? I knocked out Squid Games pretty quick. <laughs> I know one person that was like, yeah, you should check out Squid Games. I seen them the next day and they're like, it was great. I was like, oh, you liked the episode? I said, yeah, no, the whole thing was great. I was like, bro, it's only been eight hours since I seen you. <laughs> You've already watched all those? I know people who love Grey's Anatomy. Any Grey's Anatomy's fan? No? Okay, well, they're a minority. <laughs> There's like 40,000 seasons of Grey's Anatomy. And every time a new season drops, everyone's ready to go. And I, I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't really care for it. But it's a good show. It's a good show. It's about a hospital. I'm like, how many things could possibly happen in a hospital? We were on like episode 700. Now they're like, you know, what could possibly happen? We all love different seasons, different things to watch. You know what I loved growing up and still to this day I love watching it? My favorite show of all time is The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Anyone love? Do -do 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 -do. <laughs> you know you can sing the whole entire in West Philadelphia. <laughs> okay, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> we can sing the whole thing. I love Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And I remember watching The Fresh Prince, and it would come on at Nick at Night. You remember watching it at Nick at Night? Come on. Maybe you're, you know, a little older. Maybe you've seen it drop. You've seen it drop, right, when season one came out. You're like, I remember season one, the first night season one came out. I remember watching it, and I would watch 
from the beginning and you'd watch the later episodes and it's funny how much the show changed you look at the early episodes and you look at the later episodes and it's almost hard to recognize sometimes one time I was watching it and all of a sudden if you know the show you remember this out of nowhere there was a new Aunt Vivian from one day to the next she's just a totally different person one of the one of the uh, uh, the actors, they, she had contract issues, and they replaced her from one episode to the next. <laughs> Completely different person, lighter, shorter, different hair, older. Old Aunt Vivian was like, she'll throw down with you. She like she just looked like she, you know, you don't want to mess with her. New Aunt Vivian was a little soft. I was okay. This changed really quick. This happened too fast for me to even adjust. Things change over time. No matter what we're doing or where we're at in life, a continual truth is that things change. The interesting thing about life is that it's never the same. We always go through new seasons, different seasons. And here the author in Ecclesiastes is trying to communicate something very important about life. And that is this, that life has its seasons. Life has its seasons. Solomon is using juxtapositions to show us the extreme contrast that we experience through different seasons of life. He's using two totally different things to show us how quickly life can change. The words that he uses are extremely opposite words, totally different sides of the spectrum. He uses those words next to each other to contrast how different they are. And to contrast to me and you, how different the seasons of life that we go through will be. He uses words like born and die, kill and heal, tear down and build, weep and laugh, mourn and dance, tear and mend, love and hate, war and peace. Totally different words, totally different things, totally different seasons. But he puts them next to each other to show me and you a truth that through this life, we will experience extremely different seasons. As I grow older, I can more identify with Solomon's truths here. Because I know now that life has its ups and its downs. Life has its highs and its lows. It has its mountains and its valleys. I've recently been thinking a lot about seasons. And how even us, us as believers, we too will go through different seasons. Even in a relationship with the Lord, me and you are going to go through some seasons. Me and you are going to go through some ups and some downs, some highs and some lows, some mountains and some valleys. I've been thinking a lot about it because in my personal life, I could think about the seasons that God has taken me through. And nothing brings a sharper contrast to me than when I think about this time this year and this time last year. When I think about where my life is at now compared to my, where my life was at then, I feel like Solomon putting two words next to each other. My life last October, I, it was a dark season for me. I'm going to be transparent with you. It was a very dark season for me and my family. It was a season where we were losing my father-in-law, my, 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 uh, my wife's father. And when my wife's father was, was battling sickness, it was a very hard season. I remember this time last year, I was up early in the morning praying prayers that I never prayed. Lord, I need you to move. God, why did you bring me here? Lord, what's going on? Father, I don't understand. Praying prayers like, Lord, where are you? God, I've been giving my life, but I can't find you. Lord, what are you doing in this season? Lord, I don't understand. My father-in-law, who was battling a sickness, he went on to be with the Lord. And I remember when he, when he passed away, I remember that whole season, I felt like I was in a cloud. 
I felt like I was in a cloud of confusion, a cloud of misunderstanding, a cloud of wrestling and reasoning with the Lord, a cloud where I maybe felt misunderstood by people around me, a season where it was me, God, and a conversation that we had to have on a daily basis. I found myself in a dark place. And it's funny because as I look at it now, and I look at where my life is today, one year later, I see that it's a totally new season. I look at what God has done in my life. The biggest contrast to me was the birth of my daughter. When I had my, my daughter, it was such a contrast to me of the season that I was in before. Today, I'm in a season of joy. When you walk into our room, what was a room of tears last year is a room of joy. What was a room of mourning has become a room of praising. What was a room of despair and confusion became a room of clarity and understanding. What was a room of, Lord, where are you, is a room of, Lord, I'm grateful and I'm thankful that you never leave me no matter the seasons that I go through. As believers, we will go through hard and testing seasons. This is what the Lord has been impressing on my heart. As we're here and we're building a church, you're going to be sitting in these chairs. And week after week, you're going to come and lift your hands. But you might look the same on the outside. But the circumstances in your life may look different. One year they might look great. The next year they might be hard. One month it might be up. The next month it might be down. Me and you have to learn how to persevere through seasons. You know, it's a misconception that when you give your life to the Lord that everything gets better. A, that's a misconception. Whoever told you that when you gave your life to Jesus, everything in your life was going to be perfect, they lied to you. Call that person today and say, you lied to me. <laughs> what happens when we, when, we, when we present that to people, you give your life to Jesus, everything's going to be better. Your, 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 your marriage is going to be better. Your life is going to be better. All those things are true. I'm not saying that Jesus isn't the difference maker, but it does take time. And when we paint the picture to, G, uh, with, to people as an instant fix for everything in their life, they can come to a point where they get disappointed with the Lord. We prepare them to be let down. We prepare them. You know, when Jesus in Matthew 7, he was saying, you who hear my words and put it into practice, you are like those who build their house on the rock. For when the winds and the waves come, it will not fall. But you who hear my words and do not put it into practice, you are like those who build their house on the sand. For when the winds and waves come, that house will fall and great will be its fall. See, this portion of scripture has always ministered to me because the Bible doesn't say that us as believers who put God's word into practice, it doesn't say that when the, wind, the winds and waves that they'll never come. The Bible doesn't say if you build your house on the sand, the winds and waves will come, it'll knock it down. But if you build your house on the rock, you do what, I, what I'm telling you to do, you put my instruction into place, you'll never face a storm. The Bible doesn't say that. It prepares those who put God's word into practice and those who don't put God's word into practice. It prepares them for the same seasons of life. See, whether you believe in the Lord and you put his word into practice or you don't, no matter what, you're still going to go through seasons when you feel rain knocking on your door. You're, we're going to go through seasons where we're in a storm we don't understand. But the thing is, the, the, the X factor in all of this is, where is our foundation at? See, we're, we're raising up believers here in Victory Every Sur Wave LA who they're building their house on the rock, that we're putting God's word into practice and we're building a foundation so that when the winds and waves of this life come, that we are not caught off guard, that we are not wavered, that we are not tipped over, but that we stand and we stand the test of time. What we must understand, if we want to serve God for life, is that every season has a purpose. Every season has a purpose. I don't know what season you find yourself in today, but I can tell you this, that there's purpose in your season. 
And we must learn how to squeeze everything we could get out of the season that we're in. There's lessons that God is trying to teach us through certain seasons. There's lessons and principles and values that God can only teach us through certain seasons. Some of us here this morning, maybe, maybe we're in a season of humility. Maybe we're in a season of confusion. Maybe we're in a season of breakthrough. Maybe we're in a season of provision. Maybe we're in a season of testing. No matter where you find yourself here today, there is purpose inside of your season. And we have to learn how to squeeze every ounce of principle, value, and lesson that God is trying to teach us in the seasons that we find ourselves in. Wherever you're at today, there's a purpose. Wherever you're at today, there's a reason. But if we just ask God for the next season, we'll miss what he's doing now. If we just say, Lord, I'm tired of where I'm at. I don't know what you're doing. I'm ready for the next season. If you just live your life anticipating what's next, we'll miss what God's doing now. Even if you're in a crazy place that you don't understand, I dare you to say, Lord, what are you doing now? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me? What are you trying to build in me? What are you trying to reveal to me? There's some things that God can only teach by putting you in an arena and leaving you alone and testing your life. Wherever you find yourself today, there's purpose in your season. There's lessons we can learn if we learn how to squeeze every ounce out of the seasons God puts us in. Today I want to talk to you about three seasons all of us will experience. The first season is a season of victory. Look at your neighbor say victory. You know the good news is that we'll experience victory in this life. When you became a child of God, you walked into a victorious season. Because even though me and you might go through the trials of this life, we're living life bigger than the now. We have the hope of heaven. When we encounter Jesus and we accepted him into our heart, me and you are not just living for the now. We're living for a time that will come when time ceases and we spend an eternity with the Lord. That's good news this morning because there's some people living their life that don't have the hope of heaven. But we are children of God. We are victorious in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, it says, but thanks be to God. Who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8.37 says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. We are more than conquerors. Me and you, we're more than conquerors. We are victorious in Christ. Me and you, we're, we were created for victory. You know, there's purpose in seasons of victory. Have you ever been through a season of victory? Maybe you haven't. I'm, not, I'm saying this legit because one time I asked my pastor, I said, Pastor, do, you, do we ever win in this life? It's a real conversation. I, I'm not lying to you. I was, I was going through so many lows <laughs> that I, I asked my pastor one day, I said, Pastor, is there ever victories in this thing? I felt like I had gone through so many lows that I couldn't even conceive that there were highs. I had gone through so many lows, so many tests, so much confusion, so much just having to soldier through a season, just having to trust God through it, that I, I started to ask the question, like, do we ever start winning? Do we ever become victorious? And my pastor looked at me and he said, you'll have your mountain. You'll have your mountain. You'll have a day where the valley ends and the mountain starts. You'll have a day where you realize that everything that happened there was for everything that was going to happen here. We were created for victory. The purpose in seasons of victory many times are so that we learn the power of God. When we see victory, we learn the power of God. I've seen bodies healed before. I've seen people walk into the house of God with cancer and leave cancer free. And when I seen that victory take place, it fueled me. It, it, it put something in me that trusted in how big God's power was. Have you ever seen something like that? Experience something where you know that you know that you know that the power of God is real? 
In seasons of victory, we learn the size of God, that he's big, that he's able, that he's bigger than anything we're facing, that he's bigger than any trial, any circumstance. In seasons of victory, we see the true size of our God. We learn to trust God. We learn that God keeps his promises. You know, God's a promise keeper. He will keep his promise that is on your life. And in seasons of victory where we see promise fulfilled or we see glimpses of the promise, it gives us fuel to keep going. Because we know, man, God, you're, you're going to do it, man. I've seen a glimpse of it. I, I've seen you do it. Has the Lord done a miracle in your life? All of us, I, I, I dare to say all of us in the room have experienced victory. If you've given your life to the Lord, you have experienced victory in your life. There's many of us here today that the victory that we experience is an extreme victory. Some of us were down and out. We were lost with no cause when Jesus found us and put victory inside of our life. Some of us were tore up from the floor up. And, and maybe not even on the outside. I, I'm not someone, I don't think I was ever tore up on the outside, but I was tore up on the inside. My heart was tore up from the flora. My mentality was tore up from the flora. My perspective was tore up from the flora. The way I thought, the way I operated, the, the sin that was inside of me. But all of us here today, if you've given your life to the Lord, you're a miracle. You're a mark of God's power. You are proof that God is who he says he is. You are proof that God is a big God, that he's a miracle working God, that he is faithful to generations. You are proof of God's power this morning. Many of, many of us, maybe we're here because our parents were saved. You're a proof of God's faithfulness. You're a proof of God's faithfulness. Maybe, maybe you're the first person in your family to ever get saved. You're proof that God can break any chain. Proof that he can cancel any curse. You're, you're, you're proof here this morning. You're living proof of what God can do. I thank God for seasons of victory because they keep me going even in times of defeat. Because <laughs> I remember how big God is. I remember that he did it before. I remember who he really is. Paul wrote something interesting in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12 through 13. He said this. He said, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul was, Paul was almost warning us here. He was warning us that not only do we have to learn how to go without, but we also have to learn how to have much. Both of those seasons are learning seasons. See, sometimes we think, I'm going to learn in my, in, in my not having so I can, I, can, I can one day have a lot. And we think the lesson is in not having. But Paul said, I learned the secret of having a lot and not having anything. Because both of those seasons are seasons where we have to learn. You know, in seasons of victory, we have to learn how to be victorious. You know, there's, there's people sometimes that get to seasons of victory and they make mistakes because they don't know how to be victorious. You have to learn how to have victory because it's so easy to fall into the dangers that come with seasons of victory. There's danger when you're in a victorious season. One of the dangers is that we lose faith because we become satisfied. In season of victory, when things are going well, when, when everything's clicking and everything's going and, and, and everything's going as planned, it's easy to lose faith for the next season because we're satisfied with what's going on. In seasons of victory, we have to cling to a radical faith that believes God for more. In seasons of, of, of victory, it's easy to neglect time of prayer with the Lord. 
See, when everything's, when everything's going wrong and, and everything is just, when you don't know what's happening in your life and, and it's easy to go and weep before the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what you're doing. But what about when everything's going right? Paul said, I had to learn how to do both. I had to learn the season of having nothing and I had to learn the season of having more than I needed. Because there's dangers in both seasons. The children of Israel constantly experienced this. They constantly went without. They cried to the Lord. The Lord heard their cry and provided. Then they forgot all about him. In seasons of victory, in seasons of breakthrough, in seasons of provision, it's important not to forget the Lord. I, I believe there's going to be those here in Victory Hour's Third Wave LA that in your finances, you're going to see breakthrough like you've never seen it before. I believe God's going to raise up entrepreneurs. He's going to raise up business owners. I believe he's going to raise up CEOs and supervisors in the house of the Lord. That you're going to experience extreme multiplication in your finances. But I want to warn you, don't forget the Lord. Don't forget the Lord. Why do we have, why do we come and we, 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 we do uh, offering and, and, and we read a scripture and we teach the principle of giving? It's not because God needs our money. It's so that we can instill a principle within all of our hearts, a, a principle of generosity. And, and when you're generous, you're in a place where you don't forget God. Lord, I know that you have me here for a reason. Lord, I know it's only you the reason why I'm here today. There's dangers in seasons of victory. David learned this the hard way too. In 2 Samuel 24, and paralleled with 1 Chronicles 21, David learns lessons about victory. See, King David was a mighty king. David was a conqueror. David was a warrior. David was God's man. David, David had a, a relationship with the Lord. David knew what it was like to, to, to not be wanted by anyone, but, but God wanted him. God raised him up, and God made him the king of Israel. But in 2 Samuel 24, we see an interesting event. It's David's census of the people of Israel. David tells his government officials that he wants to take a census of the children of Israel. Have you ever done a census for, for the United States? You got to fill, if, if you haven't, you should. It's how we count our people. <laughs> you got to fill out the card. You got to write your name on it. This is how, how do we figure out how many people are in America? It's because we do a census. There's a card that goes to your house or we fill it out. It asks you what you are, who you are, your race, your ethnicity. I never know what to put because it doesn't have Latino or Hispanic. It just, it just says Caucasian. I didn't know what to put on there. <laughs> I remember many times I'm like, okay, I don't know what to put. I got to call them. If you've ever done a census, you've encountered these different questions that are on there. And so we fill it out and we send it in. What happens then? The nation is doing a, consen a census. It's, it's getting a count of the people in the land, where they're at, how, how many is this, how many is that, how many are here, how many are there. And so David here in this portion of scripture, he wants to take a census. Now, I always ask myself, what was wrong with David's census? He's just counting the people. It's, it's probably structural. It probably works well for a government to know how many people are in the land. Why, why was God so angry with David when David took his census? You know why? As I look deeper into it and I studied into David's census, you'll find that in these times, when a man did a census and he went out to count what was in the land, a man only counted what belonged to him. A man only counted what belonged to him. So if I was counting my household, I would only count the sheep that belonged to me. If something belonged to another man, I couldn't count it. I would only count what was my property. I owned it. And so David, as he's counting the people of Israel, he's making a statement. These are my people. I did this. This is my glory. When all along, it was never David. All along, it was the Lord. And the Lord had to deal with David because David was in a place of victory where he started counting everything in his life like it was his. 
I did this. I got here. I built this. I'm the one who put it together. I'm the one who led the people. I'm the one who put everything, the hard work, the sacrifice. It was me. David forgot that before he had an encounter with the Lord, he was just a shepherd boy, forgotten in a field somewhere. And it was only God's sovereignty that seen him there and picked him up and gave him a purpose and made him king over everything in Israel. It wasn't David who did it. It was God who did it. But now David wants to count everything and say, all of this belongs to me. The Lord said, uh, knock, knock, David. David. David, rude awakening, that belongs to me. We got to get careful that we don't start counting the things in our life like they're ours. In seasons of victory, it's easy to say, I did this. I got here. It was my ingenuity. It was my mind. It was my hard work. It was my hands that built this. It was my feet that did this. It was my heart that had to travail for this. I'm the one who built this thing. I'm the one who worked hard on my business. I'm the one who invested in my, I'm the one who did all this. This this victory belongs to me. God has a way of waking us up and making us realize that the victory doesn't belong to us, that the victory belongs to God. The victory belongs to Jesus. One way or another, we'll realize that the victory was never ours. David had to learn how to be victorious. David had to learn how to not count it as his thing. The second season that we all must go through is seasons of defeat. Seasons of defeat. All of us will endure seasons of defeat. Have you ever been in a season of defeat? Wave at me. Wave at me. You've ever been defeated. You know, I've been defeated before. I could wave everything I got at you. I've been defeated. I've been, I've been defeated to the point where I didn't know if I could go on anymore. I've been defeated to the point where I'm like, should I just throw in the towel? Who do I got to call to just throw it in? <laughs> I've, been, I've been this close. I've been this close to calling the leaders that God put in my life and saying, you know what? I'm not the one. I'm not the one. Let's call it a day. Let's just, let's just, let's just figure this out. <laughs> you know what's crazy? That there's always something that's, there's always this just like this, this, this presence of God that's always stopping us from throwing in that towel. Have you ever been there before where you just want to do it, but you don't even know how? When you're like, I want to quit, but I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I want to give up, but I don't even know what the first step of giving up looks like. There's times where we go through these times of defeat. The Bible tells us that it rains on the just and the unjust alike. All of us will have to go through seasons of defeat. I don't know what defeat looks like to you. Maybe it's a time of turmoil in your marriage. Maybe it's the bitter ending of a friendship, the burning of a bridge, a time of going without, the death of a loved one, trouble with our children, sickness or disease in our lives or with the family member. See, the Apostle Paul understood seasons when he wrote to the church in Galatia, and he instructed them not to grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, for in due season, you will reap a reward. See, there is a due season that comes to all of our lives. You might be in a place where you're giving it all you got and you don't see the Lord moving. You might be in a place where you're questioning where you are with the Lord, where you're questioning God, where are you? But I came today to tell you, just keep going because in due season, I said in due season due season you'll reap and you'll say I'm glad I didn't give up in the confusion I'm glad I didn't give up in the chaos in seasons of defeat there's important things to remember we must not lose who we are in seasons of defeat it's easy to lose who we are it's easy to compromise our values In seasons of defeat, we start acting different. I'm telling you because I've been there before. In seasons of defeat, we start to question our identity. In seasons of defeat, this is important. This is very important. In seasons of defeat, we must not distance ourselves from the presence of God. 
In seasons of defeat, we must not distance ourselves from the presence of God. That's what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you to, to, to separate yourself. He, he wants you to isolate yourself so that he can have you alone in a room. You might be in a room full of people, but you're alone in your mind. And the enemy is having a field day with our perspective. The enemy is having a field day with the way we think, with the way we view people. Have you been there before? In seasons of defeat, there's a lot going on in the mind. You'll step into a room and, and, and you'll think to yourself, oh, that guy don't like me. <laughs> you'll just start putting things together. Like, that guy don't like me. I bet he doesn't know what I'm going through. He thinks he this and she this and she that and he this. and None of that even exists. The Bible says that the enemy is an accuser of the brethren. He, he, he will put things in your mind. He'll put a novella in your mind that's not even real. We're, working, we're walking through the church with the novella in our head. She's thinking this and he's plotting that. <laughs> what are they talking about over there? Me? <laughs> They're going over the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> don't let the enemy do, have a novella in your mind it's important in times of defeat to get hold of your mind and the way you can get hold of your mind is to get into the presence of God where God starts to minister to you where his Holy Spirit comes alongside you and starts to push you and say no 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 you can keep going no 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 fix your perspective no 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 don't give in to the lies of the enemy it's important, too, that as brothers and sisters, when we see somebody in a time of defeat, that we pull them closer. Sometimes, they, sometimes our, we need our brother, our sister to pick us up and take us to the presence. I've been in seasons where I couldn't even take myself there. I needed somebody to pick me up. That's why the Bible says two are better than one. For if one falls, who is there to pick them up? I heard somebody say the, the, the okay, this is bad, but they said it. They said the, they said this. You ready? They said the army of the Lord many times is the only army that kills its own wounded. What does that mean? Sometimes we see someone on the ground and we just keep walking. We see someone on the ground. We see our brother, our sister on the ground and we ignore it. Or we say, that's what they get. I try to warn them. I try to tell them, see, brother, this is what happens. No, 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 no. We can't, we can't, we can't kill our wounded. We got to pick them up and put them back together and say, get yourself back in the game. I know you've gone through a lot. I know you've been through a lot, but you got to take yourself back to the presence of God where he'll make everything clear. We'll give you a new perspective. We'll put a new fire inside of your life. Pick your brother up. Pick your sister up. And pray that the Lord shows you who's on the ground. The Apostle Paul, when he experienced defeat, he said this in 2 Corinthians 4.8. He said, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through the suffering of our bodies, continue to share in the death of Jesus so that Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. He said, you can see me on the floor, but I'm not going to stay there. You might see me in a place where I look hungry, but believe me, one day I'm going to get back up. Paul said, if you ever see me on the floor, don't worry, I'll be back. Paul said, if you ever see me in a place where I look crushed, don't worry, I'm not. Not because of what Paul, who Paul is, but because of who Christ is. When you have Jesus in your life, you could look crushed, but on the inside, you're, you're, you're keeping going. There's something inside you that keeps walking forward. It keeps moving. Even when people around you say, man, you should take a break. You should take a seat. No, no, no. There's Jesus inside of me, and he helps me to keep going. You might, be not get, you might be knocked down this morning. The Lord sent me to tell you you're not destroyed. Yeah, you might be on the ground, but you're not destroyed. You're still here today. You still walked into the house of God. He still, still going to breathe life into you. 
How will our character respond in times of defeat? I'm getting ready to come to a close. Job was a man who experienced defeat. He lost all of his children. He lost his wealth. He lost his health. If you think you've lost a lot, Job, I guarantee you, lost so much more. All of his children in his household, everything he owned, all of his possessions, his health. As the worship team makes their way, he lost everything. But even in the midst of losing everything, look at his response. In Job 13, 15, Job declares, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Job didn't understand what was happening around him. He didn't understand why he was losing everything. He didn't understand why he was in a season of defeat. But he knew this. No matter where I'm at, what I'm going through, what's happening around me, God is good. God is loving. God is trustworthy. Job may not have understood what was happening around him, but he decided to squeeze his season for everything it was worth. Squeeze it. Here I am, Lord. If you have me in a place of defeat, teach me while I'm here. If you have me in a place, a lowly place, Lord, teach me. Show me. Show me what you're doing. David had a moment like this also. Where the third thing, the third thing that we experience, the third season that we have, is a season of understanding. A season of understanding. might be in seasons of victory, seasons of defeat. But through it all, we also go through seasons where we start to understand. Lord, I get it. Lord, I know why you did that. Lord, I, 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 I didn't see it in the moment, but I can see it now. David had a moment like that in the cave of Adullam. That cave, he went to cry out to the Lord place he thought he was going to die but that cave was never intended to kill him it was intended to build him the cave was never supposed to kill him it was supposed to build him you might find yourself in a cave this morning it's not supposed to kill you it's not supposed to destroy you it's a learning place Joseph as we all stand here today Joseph had this moment, just like David. Joseph was given a promise, but then was beaten and bloodied by the brothers that he loved. Imagine the people that you thought loved you the most beating you down, stripping you of everything you have, and throwing you into slavery. They threw him in a box to be taken into slavery. Right after there was a promise on his life, every head bowed and every eye closed. Joseph, he had a promise. But as his brothers were there, they beat him, they bloodied him, they bruised him, they threw him into a cistern to be sold into slavery. Little did Joseph know, little did Joseph know that his brothers, who it felt like betrayal, it felt like, man, God, what are you doing? You told me I was going to be great. You told me I had a promise, but now I find myself here in a cistern being sold into slavery. What Joseph would come to realize later, when he got to the place that God had called him, when God made him 
a governor of all the land of Egypt, many, many years later, he would look back on this moment and what he understood about that moment, even though he was being bleed, even though he was being bloodied and bruised, his brothers who thought that they were killing him, they were actually serving a purpose in his life. His brothers were beating him into his destiny. They were bruising him into his purpose because it had to happen for God to take him to his next season. It had to happen. Wherever you're at right now, there's a season that's intentional to get you to the next place. Right there, yeah, lift up your hands. Maybe you've been questioning your season. You've been saying, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. Maybe you've been struggling in your marriage. Maybe you've been through seasons of fighting, seasons of disunity. Maybe you've been in a place of victory. But you feel like, man, I, I, I feel like in this place of victory, I'm, I'm losing myself. I feel like maybe I've strayed from my convictions. Maybe you're in a place where you're saying, Lord, I need understanding. I, I, I don't know what you're doing in my life. Just right there, yeah, lift up your hands. And just even in your seat, right there, have a moment with the Lord. Lift your hands. Say, Lord, here I am. Lord, minister to me, Lord. Speak to me, Jesus. This is Brittany here, and we want to thank you for tuning in to Third Wave LA YouTube channel. We pray that this message has spoken to you. And what we want you to do right now is to make sure you like, subscribe, and share this link to someone that will also be impacted by this message. Also, if you want to stay up to date with what's taking place at Third Wave LA, make sure you subscribe to all of our social media platforms. This is Third Wave LA, where hope is found and purpose is lived out.